Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I'll read from a book titled The Nature Inside, uh, Plants and Flowers in the Modern Interior by Penny Spark, uh, published by Yale University Press. Study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. Frank Lloyd Wright We seem today to be infatuated with indoor plants and flowers. Many of our everyday public indoor spaces are full of them, while glossy magazines depict miniature jungles in stylish domestic interiors. Putting plants and flowers in containers and bringing them inside are not new activities, however. Egyptian, early Chinese and Middle Eastern civilizations embraced such practices, as did the ancient Greeks. The Romans grew plants in terracotta pots and filled the inner atria of their houses with them, though those spaces were open to the sky. Yet, despite these continuities, by the late 18th century, nature inside had taken on multiple new meanings in the Western world. This book sets out to tell a story about the inclusion of plants and flowers in interior spaces from that moment onwards, with an emphasis on developments in Britain, continental Europe and the United States. In this book, numerous 20th and 21st century interiors are unpacked in the context of 19th century ideas and practices related to bringing nature inside. While the functions and meanings of indoor nature have inevitably changed over time, its roles as an ed memoir of the pre-industrial past, as a form of therapy for human beings and as an active agent in the creation of a non-toxic environment have arguably remained intact through the whole period. Providing a counterpoint to rapid urbanization, to the hard forms and materials of modern architecture and to the cultural dominance of advanced technologies, in a variety of ways nature inside has consistently offered a much-needed anchor to otherwise unchained progress. Historians of interiors rarely address the aspidistra in the corner or the vase of flowers on the table. Plants and flowers grow and die, and are often thought to have been put in place at the last minute for photographers. Ignored as vital components of spaces, they are relegated to the inferior status of representations of nature, mere onlookers in the interiors they occupy. On one level, therefore, this book offers a new account of the history of modern architecture and interior design that focuses on the presence of plants and flowers in otherwise exclusively cultural settings. Given that this is a design historical study, the structure of the book follows a familiar chronological narrative that moves through Victorian historicism to European modernism and on to American and global late modernism. Over the years, nature inside has become in turn a commodity, a marker of colonial power, a sign of aristocratic wealth and status, a component of Victorian middle class feminine domesticity, an aesthetic strategy within European modernist architecture, a humanizing factor within late modernism in the private and public spheres, a tool within late economic capitalism, a subject of the modern scientific paradigm and a marker of the environmental crisis. This book uses many examples to illustrate its vast subject. Together they tell a story of the main trends and ideas that drove the movement of nature inside. Several of the individual plants used in the interior settings uh, under review, including the palm, the fern, the cactus, the Swiss cheese plant and the rubber plant, have been singled out as representatives of the moments in which they were both fashionable and meaningful. The focus throughout the book is on real plants located in actual interiors rather than on the multiple ways in which nature has been represented in paintings, on wallpapers and on fashionable fabrics, or imagined in idealized settings. The aim has been to add the idea of the natural to the categories of the visual, the material and the spatial. Four important themes weave in and out of its narrative. First, the commodification of plants was a byproduct of the colonial aims of classification, control and ownership. Also, without the trading that took place during the colonial era, most of the plants that were subsequently used in inside spaces would never have left their native lands. 
The legacy of colonialism is therefore felt uh, throughout this story. Second, an association between nature and the female gender occurs as a leitmotif throughout the study, especially and surprisingly in the context of the domestic sphere. The fact that 19th century greenhouses were usually attached to ladies' rooms, that the responsibility for 19th century window gardening lay with female amateur interior decorators, that several female architects and designers, among them Lili Reich, uh, Aino Alto and Ray Imes, were probably responsible for introducing nature into the interiors of buildings designed by their modernist husbands and partners, and that the eco-feminist movement, which emerged in the 1980s, has played such a key role within recent environmental politics, all support that association. Thirdly, while plants and flowers were embraced in a range of private, semi-private and public indoor spaces throughout the period under review, the intentions behind their inclusion in those different arenas varied considerably. In the private home, individuals benefited directly, both uh, physically and psychologically, from the presence of indoor nature and its ability to absorb toxins uh, from the air and oxygenate it. Once nature inside entered the commercial arena, however, it was frequently used to further the ends of economic capitalism. Human beings, it was believed, worked and shopped harder when they were surrounded by relaxing plants. Finally, the idea that plants and flowers are active rather than passive inhabitants of inside spaces also pervades the pages of this book. In the final decades of the 20th century, the French philosopher Bruno Latour, together with members of the environmentalist movement, suggested that human beings are not alone in being able to exercise agency. Russell Hitchings even suggested that though human beings believe they control nature, the truth may be the reverse, that nature is controlling them. Although this book uh, deals specifically with the story of indoor plants and flowers, it is also important to remember that they function as representatives of nature in its entirety. They are therefore implicated in the complex debates that have taken place over many years about the relationship between nature and culture. Since the 18th century, these two concepts have been understood as having a dualistic relationship, one which many ecologically oriented writers see as laying at the heart of today's environmental issues. Nature became a near component of culture through its commodification from the 18th century onwards. Its presence in inside spaces brought it even closer to culture. As a result, plants and flowers became quasi-objects, contained and displayed in inside spaces. That double layering of cultural formation makes this study's task of deciphering the role of indoor plants and flowers a complex one. Indoor plants and flowers have been able to change their symbolic meanings to suit the dominant agendas of the day. Most recently, they have come to represent all the issues being addressed by environmentalists. Whatever functions and meanings Nature Inside takes on in the future, it is clear that our desire to bring plants and flowers into our indoor spaces is not going away in the short term. Whether in the home, the workplace, the shopping mall or in the spaces that operate across the private-public divide, by inviting greenery and flowers inside we feel that we are engaging with nature and helping to re-establish a more balanced relationship with it. Penny Spark is Professor of Design History and Director of the Modern Interiors uh, Research Centre at Kingston University in London. As for the book at your local bookstore, thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video. Bye.